Great. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this open session of the Committee on the Security of America's Medical Product Supply Chain. My name is Wally Hopp, and I'm, I guess, your host for this session. Um, th these, for anybody who's joining us via the live stream, this is an informational gathering session. Nothing that we're discussing here is for public consumption or reporting. We will be issuing a report uh, in early 2022 with our findings and recommendations. Uh, and that will have gone through the formal pro uh, review process. So with that, um, we'd like to get started with our agenda, which is to hear from the FDA and ASPR on what activities they have going on uh, related to enhancing the resiliency of the medical product supply chain. And so our first uh, guest panelist is Tammy Beckham, who is Associate Director for Resilient Supply Chain at the Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation um, at the uh, FDA. So Tammy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. So um, good afternoon, and um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what FDA CDRH uh, is focused on um, while we're working on creating and enhancing resiliency in the medical device supply chain. So the discussion that, it, that you're having today is actually very timely. Um, as the FDA CDRH Office of Strategic Partnerships and Technology Innovation is in the early stages of implementing a new program um, the Resilient Supply Chain and Shortages Prevention Program, whose vision and outcomes are focused on increasing the resilience of the supply chain in the U.S. for medical devices. Um, but before I talk a little bit about the new program and the activities related to that, I'd just like to spend a few minutes discussing the work that CDRH has performed during the pandemic and the work that we're currently performing as we speak right now. Um, and how we've helped and worked to prevent and mitigate shortages in medical devices over the last 18 months. And as you know, the lessons learned during the last 18 months can and should be leveraged. And I think that's why part of the reason we're here today to ensure that whether it's the next pandemic or another type of emergency, such as a hurricane or other natural disaster, that we are in a better place and better prepared to proactively instead of reactively address the potential supply chain issues and ensure equitable access to both safe and quality medical devices throughout the U.S. So from the very beginning of the pandemic and even before the public health emergency was declared in the U.S., uh, CDRH has worked with our United States government partners, stakeholders, healthcare delivery organizations, distributors, and other entities that make up the medical device enterprise to eliminate supply chains, uh, understand those supply chains, anticipate supply chain disruptions, prevent and where appropriate, work with our partners to mitigate those supply chains uh, shortages. So this work has not been without challenges, of course. Uh, early in the pandemic, uh, as you're aware, and as we've seen throughout the pandemic, medical devices that are critical for patient care um, have been in short supply. And the, early in the pandemic, the lack of medical device shortage reporting authorities uh, for the medical device area and CDRH and a dedicated budget to support shortage and supply chain activities did hamper our ability to act more proactively. So as a result of that, um, we had the need to detail hundreds of employees away from whatever their daily activities were in the FDA to support supply chain activities and shortage investigations. Uh, so personnel embarked on what is still today and was then a very manual process to gather supply chain data and manufacturing information so that we could better understand and evaluate where um, appropriate work with our USD partners uh, to recommend or implement mitigation strategies would have an impact. So in spite of the, the challenges that we faced, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, CDRH has been able to contact over 1,000 manufacturers in over 12 countries. We've performed horizon scanning to continue to access, the, uh, access, access uh, demand for devices needed to respond to the pandemic and to proactively identify potential supply chain disruptions. As I mentioned, we perform detailed supply chain eliminations for the most critical medical devices. And we really work closely, and you're going to hear me talk about this over and over with our stakeholders, so that we had a greater understanding of the usage patterns, the challenges, 
the obstacles and potential solutions. Um, and last but not least, we've maintained a medical device shortage list and implemented the new shortage authorities that were provided under the CARES Act to FDA to DRH. And as you know, the CARES Act enacted in March of 2020 gave FDA for the first time authorities related to device shortages in Section 506J of the FDNC Act. And in 506J, um, the section requires manufacturers to notify FDA of certain supply disruptions during or in, in advance of a public health emergency. And this new authority has certainly been helpful, um, but the temporal limitations and ties to the public health emergency declaration still puts us in uh, a little bit of a spot to be behind in terms of responding to any early signs of supply constraints or potential shortage situation. So throughout COVID-19, FDA CDRH has worked with our USG partners and other stakeholders um, to assess the impact of shortages and identify or recommend and implement appropriate mitigation. Uh, FDA has utilized regulatory mitigations where appropriate to alleviate potential shortages, and those include but are not limited to uh, umbre umbrella emergency use authorizations, enforcement policy guidance, and expedited 510K applications. In addition, FDA has issued letters to healthcare providers, held numerous webinars and virtual town halls, and worked with our partners to identify suitable alternatives to medical devices, uh, including diagnostics and testing. And we have worked across CDC, BARDA, SNS, DOD, AFRA, and FEMA um, to identify and support additional mitigation strategies such as priority ratings. And we routinely work with ASPR and the SNS to evaluate items for the SNS and or determine the need for priority ratings for specific devices, components, and or even raw materials. As we saw after the Texas winter storms uh, earlier in 2020, 2021, uh, we really did face uh, some downstream effects from shortages uh, that occurred because of the shutdown of the oil and gas industry with regards to resin. Uh, and the use of that product and the raw materials uh, for medical devices. So as I said previously, we really work with stakeholders, manufacturers, and distributors to get this greater understanding of boots on the ground challenges and the medical device supply chain, really looking all the way through the device chain from end to end, to end. so looking at uh, raw materials, uh, the components, medical device, uh, manufacturing itself and assembly, all the way through distribution, um, and even the challenges associated with the last mile and delivery. And so some of the good examples of our work here include um, the healthcare delivery organizations, and we're working with them, professional organizations, to understand challenges that were associated with uh, N95 adoption of new or novel brands, and even the challenges associated with fit testing for those new types of N95 respirators. So we do value the relationships and partnerships very much that we've developed during COVID. And we really look forward to continuing to build on that foundation so that we can advance um, opportunities like public-private partnerships that will help us increase transparency uh, and around the supply chain and, and, and hence achieve a greater understanding of that supply chain. So key to building and ensuring a resilient supply chain is going to be in the future, clearly our ability to work with our stakeholders um, to generate that transparency, to share best practices, to talk about development of our mitigation plans, to be able to utilize the data to generate informational products that will be able to provide manufacturers and the medical device industry with information that's going to be needed um, to predict and prevent supply chain disruptions and even understand demand. Um, these activities are going to help ensure that we have proactive measures that can be taken so that we are, are, do not end up in the place that we started in March of 2020. So to this end, uh, I'll talk a little bit now about the new program. Uh, CDRH is currently in the early stages of building and implementing the Resilient Supply Chain and Shortages Prevention Program. We've been incredibly fortunate uh, that one-time funding from the COVID supplementals has helped us to establish some temporary infrastructure and capabilities to help mitigate device shortages and look at supply chain disruptions during COVID. And it's also allowed us to implement our new legislative authorities uh, from the CARES Act. We will continue to use uh, this CARES funding and a supplemental funding uh, to further develop this new program and enhance our data acquisition, analytics, and predictive modeling capabilities around the supply chain. The strategic objectives uh, for our new program are to enable rapid intervention through proactive regulatory measures and partnerships, 
to be able to develop and apply state-of-the-art supply chain intelligence for predictive modeling and early signal detection and continuous surveillance, and to foster a more resilient supply chain through investments in preventive measures. And in order to accomplish those objectives, we are working across CDRH, across FDA, uh, with our USC partners, our stakeholders, our private uh, industry manufacturers, distributors, et cetera, so that we can work really uh, to enhance and further develop our data acquisition, analytics, and predictive modeling capabilities uh, within CDRH with the ultimate goal of being able to anticipate and prevent and even have a better visualization of the end-to-end -end supply chains that are more automated. Um, and so working with our stakeholders, we'll, we will continue to identify a relevant medical device supply chain data that would be appropriate uh, for use and integrate some of those data sources so that we can generate visualizations and dashboards and information products that can help support informed decision-making uh, both at the FDA and also the creation and within the USG and also create products to inform our stakeholders about any potential increases in demand or any potential increase uh, issues that we're seeing with supply chain uh, disruptions. We will uh, be working to develop more artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities and algorithms so that these processes become more automated over time and that the products that we generate um, will be able to be utilized, again, both within the USG and we'll be able to inform our stakeholders. So we hope by building on the relationships that we forged through COVID that we can continue to work together to find ways through public-private partnerships or other, or other methods to share some best practices around supply chain resiliency and quality and really discuss and solve many of the challenges that we faced during COVID um, with the medical device chain, supply chain to include interdependency, single sourcing, reliance on foreign sources, counterfeit, export bans, et cetera. So I just want, I want to continue to emphasize how important these strong public-private partnerships are going to be to ensure that we can continue working together um, to ensure the transparency, the understanding to the, the challenges around um, what is a very fragile and vulnerable medical device supply chain. And so I also just want to make a few remarks as I close, because I know some of the focus today uh, is on uh, demand and uh, supply and the SNS, et cetera. And, you know, during COVID, we have uh, invested, the USG has, in, in additional manufacturing capacity for many of our critical devices, PPE, testing, and diagnostics. And, and I think, you know, we must continue to ensure that we can leverage those USG investments moving forward and find uh, flexible ways uh, to work with the manufacturers to ensure that these capabilities and these capacities that we've invested in um, continue to be available when needed in the event that there is another uh, emergency or you know hurricane natural disaster that could cause a potential shortage. Um, and you know just to summarize, FDA has really worked diligently uh, throughout COVID to build capacity to support the industry and then we're appropriate to utilize effective novel regulatory measures and policies and we'll continue to build those capabilities and perform that supply chain surveillance and predictive modeling and continue to really enhance our capabilities. We've built a lot of capabilities. Like I said, many of them are, are manual at this point um, and very time consuming and resource intensive, which sometimes delays our ability to get mitigations in place. But we will work to really enhance and automate more of that surveillance and um, analysis of the supply chain so that we can more effectively and timely move on those mitigations when they're needed. And as I said, going forward, we must really continue to build on the partnerships and collaborations that have proved to be so effective during COVID and build those strong public-private partnerships to communicate, to share, and solve some of the most pressing challenges. And so with that, I'll just say thank you, and I'll be happy to answer your questions later. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tammy. Um, Lisa, do we want to uh, ask questions here now, um, or do we want to talk to Asper and then have it, because we have it kind of set up both ways, it seems in the agenda. I would say I, I defer to you. If, if you think it would be helpful to ask Tammy questions now, we can definitely do that. Well, I'm champing at the bit. I've got a whole bunch of questions. So um, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, okay, well, let, let's do that. So we, we've got enough time to do this. So let's talk uh, about that, um, what Tammy just told us a little bit here um, while it's fresh in our mind. 
So, so Tammy, if I can start, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when you talk about, you know, predictive analytics and the, the sort of uh, supply chain mapping and risk assessments that you've been doing, what information have you um, gotten from the manufacturers in order to be able to see all the way up from end to end through these supply chains? Are they revealing their um, their uh, sources of, of all their components at all levels of the supply chain? Are they revealing volumes of what they're getting from where so that you can assess those risks? So I'll use an example of uh, one of the issues that we faced. And so what I would say to your question is, yes, under um, certain circumstances that we've been able to work with our manufacturers to understand what their upstream limitations are and some of their supply chain challenges are. So when they're experiencing an upstream issue with uh, resin, for example, medical grade resin that they need to manufacture, uh, we've been able to work directly with them to understand that impact when their lines uh, shutdowns will be uh, to understand the, the, the resin specifically and the source of those resins and be able to put that into quantitative terms to understand the impact to the ability to manufacture a certain volume of product or device. And therefore, then we've been able to utilize all of that information really um, to work with uh, ASPR and DOD to look at, you know, is there a, is there a critical uh, impact to patient care here? And if so, um, do we need to, you know, step in and perhaps priority rate and order uh, that would help uh, avoid uh, either the shutdown of the manufacturing line or just their inability to manufacture enough devices to get get out the door. So yes, I mean we actually have been able to. Obviously, there is information that they do not share, and um, we we understand that. But when there has been an issue. Uh, and there is a need um, for support. We have been very, um, we've developed some really great partnerships working with distributors and manufacturers to really understand what the limitations are and how we can help mitigate those. Um, but we typically do a deep dive into what's the patient impact, what is the um, impact to the availability of the medical device we're talking about, um, what's the timeline around shutdown, what is the source? Um, is there a possibility to even mit mitigate that? And what are the potential mitigations that are available to us? You know, is it an EUA? Is it uh, a priority rating? Is it is it some other mitigative uh, strategy, mitigative strategy that we can use um, to help support and and really uh, save off a more serious uh, impact to patients? So yes, we have been able to do that. That's a long-winded answer to your question. Okay. So but when you were describing that, you described what you've been doing in the pandemic as more reactive and what you're looking right. forward to as more proactive. Because it right. sounds to me like that, that uh, analysis that you do is triggered by some kind of a problem. You have a resin exactly. shortage. Okay, let's go look into this. The problem, right. the, the cat's already out of the bag by that time. So what right. I'm asking about is, you know, um, if you have a situation where a particular class of drugs relies on the same API, which is manufactured by a single manufacturer, you may think that you have a diversified supply, but you don't until right. there's a shortage from that, that API manufacturer. And now you go, OMG, you know, that's, that's basically drying up the entire supply. Is there any way that you can get with the automated um, analytics that, that you described, you know, the, the sort of risk sensing capabilities, can you get information to populate that kind of an analysis without some sort of regulatory change that, that requires you to solicit more information from uh, the, the producers of drugs and devices than you have now? So that's a great question. And so I'm going to, I'm always going to answer the, uh, the, the, uh, the answer is, is yes. So we, we have uh, capabilities to work with um, distributors and other sources of supply chain data that can help inform. And certainly manufacturers are required right now, as, as you know, during the public health or in advance of a public health emergency to report potential shortages um, that would have supply chain disruptions. However, um, 
as you stated, the ability to do this proactively will require uh, that we are better able to work with our manufacturers and able to work with other uh, entities that might be able to provide pieces and parts of that uh, data and supply chain illumination that we're going to depend on to be able to do the to be able to look at those interdependencies like you just said and is there one single source for a particular device component and if so will we be able to use that more in a predictive way we are hoping yes we are currently working to evaluate data sources that might be available and understand what the informational content is in those data sources and how they might be integrated uh, with both internal uh, and other external data sources to get a more complete picture. But to your point, we will definitely need to have very robust relationships where we can work with in the industry uh, to understand moving forward. And again, we can't boil the ocean, so we're not going to be able to do this for every medical device. And I'm just going to speak right. on medical device uh, behalf today, not on drugs. Uh, but we will definitely need um, to work uh, on those most critical medical devices, working with the stakeholders to understand what they think those are, um, and then uh, working with them to help illuminate where those interdependencies might be. So that's why my emphasis on my talk, on my opening remarks, was really strongly focused on public-private partnerships and being able to work together to identify the data sources that will give us a more complete picture. Yeah. So it sounds like you're kind of counting on these relationships and sort of voluntarily uh, or voluntary uh, cooperation by the manufacturers. And in our discussions, we talked to a device manufacturer and they seemed rather willing to share supply chain mm -hmm. information. We've talked to some drug right. manufacturers and they were rather unwilling to share. So mm -hmm. do, you, do you anticipate that this, you know, approach, the this sort of voluntary cooperative public private partnership approach may work in some products and not so well in others? Sure, absolutely. And I think there will be, obviously, uh, those industry leaders that might be more willing to take the, you know, take a plunge and, and work with us uh, closely so that, uh, you know, demonstrating the value back, I believe, to the industry of the information that will allow us to alert them. Um, to potential issues. I think, you know, what what will we be able to provide back that will help them in their business? What will we be able to provide back to them um, so that they, that everybody has a win-win in the relationship and uh, every everybody sees the value in that. So yeah, we're, we're going to very heavily rely on those partnerships and we realize that those will take time to build. We will identify, uh, you know, early um, adopters and uh, folks that can help us demonstrate the value that we can give back to the industry um, by being able to do some of this predictive analytics. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as I am wont to do, I've uh, kind of dominated the questions here. Other committee members um, have questions or, or lines of uh, discussion that you'd like to see us engage? Craig? Thanks, Wally. And, and Tammy, good job. <laughs> I think you, <laughs> you you covered it pretty pretty nicely. Uh, you know, I, I think Wally was digging in appropriately on that set of questions. I wanted to ask along the vein of how do you share that information with those folks that are developing the response concepts of operations and the operational response plans uh, as they look at supply chain issues, uh, you know, how much are you all melded into the logistics uh, component of that response uh, army, if you will, uh, so that what you're learning gets real-time presentation and dialogue within the logistics and response part of the uh, activity. Sure. So if you're talking about the logistics and response part from the federal government, there is not even probably an hour that doesn't go by that we're not working closely with ASPR, uh, whether that is the SOC or, or others that are responding to, to shortages and impacts and the, and the White House COVID supply team as well. Um, and we work with the manufacturers themselves to, to help find uh, solutions. And so 
we're very well integrated. And I will say as the uh, response has evolved, um, I think that integration has gotten more robust. And I think the lines of roles and responsibilities within the USG themselves are starting to get more and more clarified. Uh, you know, early on in the response, I know there's been multiple people contacting manufacturers and things like that, but I, I what? Thanks, Tammy. That that you know, I it's anticipatory reality that we're trying to create here, so that the stockpiled folks, the logistics folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, are aware of potential problems that can think about appropriate substitutes if, in fact, there's mm -hmm. going to be a greater delay uh, in the primary product that they've been working with. A slow-moving event like this is more gives people more time to develop those relationships. A fast-moving uh, event, mm -hmm. not so much. But I'm glad to hear that you feel like you're starting to really get that information flow working with all folks that are responsible for the logistics. Yeah. Wally, I just want to say something. I think, Joe, it looks like you've been maybe having wanting to answer some of the questions as well. I'm not sure if you have want, any, want to add anything before your presentation. Yes, yes, please I was jump in. Throw Tammy a lifeline on uh, on pharmaceutical <laughs> supply chain. <laughs> so, um, so uh, as part of our recommendations um, in the hundred day implementation report for executive executive order fourteen thousand seventeen securing America's supply chains, uh, we actually call out for uh, getting the uh, FDA additional authorities um, to have drug makers uh, provide additional detail on. Um, where and what we source um, a, a precursor and active pharmaceutical ingredient perspective um, and actually have that included on their, uh, on their applications and labeling. So um, we are keenly aware of um, some folks that are you know, not as willing to divulge that information um, and certainly um, are looking to address that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in my part of the presentation um, and what we did with um, the uh, the CEDAR team, um, you know, towards the implementation of uh, EO fourteen seventeen. Terrific, thanks, Joe. We will definitely follow up there. Alistair, did you have a line for uh, Tammy? Yes, if you, Tammy, if you were given um, your ultimate choices, what would you like to see changed, and what uh, additional authorities or whatever would you like to have? So no that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, obviously removing the temporal limitation around the public health emergency for devices, that's something that's going to be absolutely critical and would be the first and foremost. Um, the other thing would be being able to capture uh, the risk management uh, plans uh, within the manufacturers to take a look at, you know, ensuring that there is effective risk management strategies that have been built around supply chains. And then obviously um, understanding more around the pieces, parts, components, and manufacturing uh, of the specific critical um, devices would be, would be important to us. Excellent. Um, if, if I can ask one last question before we flip over to Joe. Um, in terms of sharing uh, the results of, of the analyses you've been doing, you talked about working with your, your manufacturing partners and looking for win-wins there. What about the, the um, consumers, the health systems and so forth who are oh, purchasing these things? Do you provide information that they can use to make better decisions and manage their own risks? So we do uh, health, you know, uh, letters to healthcare providers. Uh, we have worked very closely with healthcare organizations, uh, professional organizations to help uh, them manage uh, with things like, you know, the N95s and the conservation strategies that were put around those. And then understanding the usage of boots on the ground and, and when we might be able, when the market had stabilized, to start uh, reducing some of those conservation strategies and moving back 
uh, our crisis strategies and moving back to more normal use for N95. So we do in that way work very closely uh, with those organizations. Uh, we also anticipate working even closer as we move forward uh, to, you know, get out information around potential supply chain disruptions uh, and alternatives for use. And we have been able to do that, especially with the testing and diagnostics, um, to work with the community um, to publish a set of alternatives for, for specific assays that were available, alternative sources of reagents, et cetera. And so we do work very closely with them and we'll continue to. Great, thank you. All right. Well, with that, let's let's transfer over to uh, Joe Hamill, who's director of the ASPR Program Office for Innovation and Industrial Base Expansion. Joe, let's uh, hear your perspectives on this important problem. Hey, great. Uh, and again, wonderful to be here today and, and talk to you all about what we have in motion. Um, I did prepare um, some some can talkers. Um, I don't know if we want to pull up the slides um, at least keep me um, on, on the appropriate dance steps, if you will, so I don't venture off, <laughs> but- uh, give, me, give me one second, Joe. Great, great. And hopefully I, I can do this with the proper- um... Yeah, Lisa's on tech duty today here. When I work with two monitors, I sometimes get it in the presentation or the the presentation screen um, with notes. So I just want to make sure. I'm sorry, computer screen. My computer froze. I don't know if Kelsey or Leah, if you guys have it available. I could also share mine too, Lisa, if that oh. works. Oh yeah, go ahead, Joe. Sorry about that. It's all good. No worries. That'll work. So we can all figure time, right? Uh, The one visual we need. Okay, good. Perfect. Sharing. And hopefully happy. You're sharing, but I don't see anything other than a black screen. It's 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 flowing through the do loop. <laughs> I can I can try now, Joe, if that would work. I was even, there, it is. Oh, there you Everyone's go. Got it. That's all good. right. Yay. All right. Yay. Good job. Uh, can you all still hear me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Cool. Well, hey team, uh, thanks again for having us today. Um, again, uh, really excited to talk through this. Um, you're, a number of you are all familiar with our mission, but it's really a very dynamic one um, that, that is not just uh, related to pandemic response, but as Tammy alluded to, um, ensuring that the right things are there uh, during any disaster uh, for the country. And really our primary mission is to save lives and protect Americans from health security threats in a very broad sense. Um, our new mission here, um, we're developing permanent integrated capabilities um, to, build remiss, uh, uh, to build resilient domestic medical, public health, uh, supply chain um, management, uh, and in a, uh, looking uh, at life cycle management end to end for the public health industrial base. Um, really, our overall uh, strategy here is to, to look at, um, uh, as Tammy alluded to, uh, those target volumes, those types of investments that are needed to meet those critical um, demands um, and to build out um, inventories and uh, rapid manufacturing capacities to deliver. And we've had a number of really wonderful and successful partnerships that have let us, uh, uh, you know, let us get to uh, those numbers that are required. Uh, we also um, are looking at uh, how we support all divisions um, and, you know, as we nest across the functions of BARDA, the strategic stockpile, 
our emergency medical, uh, our emergency medical operations team, um, our uh, intelligence group, uh, and um, resource management group, uh, which are really kind of the the, the contracting and acquisition side of, of what Asper does um, to help build that out and um, really kind of building out this governance process. It, it sounds a little bureaucratic, but um, it's been tremendously helpful to, to pull together um, these new supply chain industrial current steering committees um, to really work um, across the interagency with our partners, um, uh, you know, whether or not it's you know, within the HHS family um, and I'll get uh, a little further in the presentation about what we've been doing with FDA on pharmaceutical supply chain efforts um, and what we're working with others like the Development Finance Corporation, National Institute for Standards and Technology, of course, a really robust partnership with the Department of Defense um, that has allowed us to um, execute a broad swath of um, you know, uh, investments um, and, and really, you know, getting those roles, processes, responsibilities, contracts, all aligned um, to meet mission, and making sure that, you know, if the SNS is going out and you know, basically replenishing their stockpiles for personal protective equipment, that we're making confidence in manufacturers that can help them meet those goals. Something as simple as that has been really, really great to uh, you know pull together uh, across what we're doing. Um, and, and really looking at longer term sust sustainability. Um, you know, we have a wonderful uh, uh, group called our Critical Infrastructure Partnership Advisory Council. Um, we also have um, uh, these uh, Defense Production Act authorities that have been bestowed to HHS and um, ASPR is the executive agent for, um, and under Title I, Title III, and Title VII, which um, for those unfamiliar, Title I kind of um, compels priority uh, for rated contracts, uh, gets folks to the front of the line, um, and they, they're you know, to be supplied first um, when needed. Title III um, compels the building out of capacities um, that are of interest to security. Um, and Title VII is kind of a, uh, a really neat one that we haven't uh, dusted off since we won the Cold War. Um, and uh, we have a series of subcommittees uh, that are now active, um, one for drug substance and drug product manufacturing, um, one for personal protective equipment. Um, and really what it does is, um, you know, with uh, FEMA as the executive agent and hand in glove with the Department of Justice, um, we, we set plans of action. Uh, we hold these uh, forums and we have people come in and waive antitrust regulations for the purposes of the discussion uh, to do that business to business transactioning to um, you know, unkink the hose, if you will, uh, for folks that are having issues uh, in their supply chain. Um, and again, this really allows us to uh, both assess and address dynamically what's needed to uh, sustain or, or be activated or reactivated um, as we've seen uh, particularly in uh, the personal protective equipment space as of late uh, with the you know, success of the vaccines in the, in the spring um, and then um, you know, demand waning in the early summer and then enter Delta variant stage left. Um, so really um, you know, been working that dynamically in real time. Um, you know, our, for a future state, uh, we have some very specific focus areas that um, are part of our Defense Production Act activities, um, which include uh, large-scale vaccine production and administration um, for both domestic and global uh, need, uh, building out uh, platform technologies um, for um, uh, basically um, small molecule um, and biologically derived key starting materials. Um, is a, a new interesting area that we're going to be getting into. Uh, we're expanding all of our uh, personal protective equipment um, caches and manufacturing capabilities. Uh, we're also looking into the sub-tier supply chains. Um, you know, things like nitrile butadiene rubber, which we have a you know global dependency uh, in one geographic region for. Um, you know, uh, synthetic fibers like melt blown or spun bond fibers. Um, and, and also, as we um, mitigated uh, throughout the pandemic, um, you know, we can have all the all the, the the products that we need, but 
you know, the ability to assemble those at, at, at speed and scale just doesn't exist. It does not exist domestically. I mean, we were at one point, you know, um, assisting uh, performers with, you know, movement of material into, you know, Southeast Asia and getting finished product out of there just because there's, there's no cut and sew operations in the United States right now. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, assisting our, our partners with the testing and diagnostics working group um, and with RADx on uh, commercialization of their diagnostics, uh, of their diagnostics um, scaling production and fielding those. Uh, we have tremendous uh, partnerships and donation agreements with folks that um, are helping us achieve uh, large scale manufacturing capacities for durable medical, medical equipment and diagnostics. Um, and then we're leveraging our partnerships um, across the interagency with DARPA, with uh, Development Finance Corporation, with the RADx team. Um, you know, again to realize these products that have been in various forms of development over the years, um, in order to kind of get to scaled production capacity. And um, last fall, through a sprint of ours with DARPA, uh, as an example, you know, we developed a platform with them that is about the size of a, you know, a residential refrigerator that uh, makes enough um, um, neuromuscular blocking agent um, to supply the entire U.S. population. Just one unit will do that. Um, so uh, really changes the game uh, for uh, drug manufacturing for things that are in shortage. Um, one of the other activities, and, and a number of you have either gotten an email from us or will shortly, um, we have our public-private partnership with... Um, the Foundry for American Biotechnology that we started uh, before the pandemic. Um, we're working with them uh, and our uh, FDA CEDAR colleagues um, to uh, basically take a relook at the essential medicines list, uh, narrow down what we deem as critical drugs, the top 50 to 100 critical drugs, um, and then start to peel apart those, the supply chains of those in order to identify um, those vulnerabilities and risks um, that might require future investment. And again, our whole focus is um, looking at well-placed performance-based bets. Um, again, building these external partnerships to realize these capabilities uh, from a manufacturing side. I would invite you to, if you have folks that are experiencing supply chain issues, to check out meddevicenetwork.org. Great partnership with AdvaMed um, and, and, and brought to us under a donation agreement. Um, you know, uh, Bart Adventures um, has now launched um, and is, is um, you know, undertaking a number of uh, initiatives looking at everything from uh, vaccine administration, um, you know, the uh, looking at beyond the needle program um, or uh, things for oral vaccine administration. Um, and we also are partnered with the Development Finance Corporation um, on a number of uh, you know different loan products that can be made available that build complementarity to um, any contemplated manufacturing expansion uh, that would be required for either a purchase or to meet the national need under Title III. Um, so um, I'm going to get kind of specific about what we're doing for pharmaceutical supply chain and talk about the 100-day report. Um, just as a background, uh, the White House released a uh, 100-day uh, report on June 8th, um, you know, we had to immediately launch a review and, and put together a strategy to look at the vulnerabilities uh, in the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, there were others, um, you know, critical minerals, um, rare earth uh, semiconductors uh, were the other three. And then uh, we, we, us and uh, the team at the FDA Cedar, um, basically uh, focused on the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, so, you know, looking at, um, you know, what we recommended um, as, a, as a result of our review and, and the strategy development, were basically four pillars. Um, you know, we want to boost, you know, domestic production, foster international cooperation for not just nearshoring, but also friend shoring. Um, and then looking at promoting the development of novel technologies that um, you know, change the manufacturing paradigm from, you know, batch manufacturing, which has its, you know, has its benefits, um, but from a flexibility and environment, environmental impact, labor and real estate cost, um, you know, runs into problems where, um, you know, everybody's driven by the bottom line of price, 
um, for off-label drugs. And um, often, you know, those manufacturing methods and processes are subsidized by, you know, our, you know, foreign competitors. And, um, you know, we need to make things in a new way that can be tremendously cost competitive, um, which we are proving right now. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we also want to build out robust uh, quality management uh, models, um, look at quality by design, uh, and, and really you know, ensure reliable uh, manufacturing, um, and then look at how we get additional data sets to improve our supply chain resilience and um, have recommended additional authorities for the FDA in order to help us get there. Um, so uh, just to kind of address where we are with uh, kind of number one, um, you know, uh, I mentioned our public-private partnership. Um, if you haven't heard from um, um, the, uh, the foundry uh, <laughs> and, and some folks asking you to fill out a survey, let me know if you want to take part in that. Um, we have both uh, clinical communities um, and manufacturing communities uh, providing us insights on uh, what we deem is critical for patient care, but also um, where we have um, dependencies and vulnerabilities in that manufacturing supply chain. Um, and then also looking at uh, leveraging our partners with the DFC, um, uh, and, and we have a number of uh, loan products under consideration um, and, and applications under consideration and review um, to expand, you know, everything from diagnostic manufacturers to fill and finish capacities to uh, that have, um, you know, novel, um, you know, biological, uh, biologically derived production capabilities that feed into um, larger uh, manufacturing initiatives that reduce vulnerabilities um, in the key starting material space, which we find gets really dependent on offshore uh, uh, capacities very fast. Um, and then of course, uh, we are uh, working with uh, state and the Department of Commerce um, to rigorously uh, collaborate with our allies and, and look at what their investment strategies are and where there are opportunities to, to build together. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, really looking at um, developing these integrated uh, uh, small footprint manufacturing platforms um, that can really reduce supply chain demands for either the, you know, the key starting materials, uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredients, um, but even the finished dose form uh, drugs. Um, what we're finding is, um, you know, we have a couple performers right now um, that are, are, are sprinting, uh, developing those production pathways, demonstrating scaled production of um, sterile injectable drugs that are in shortage right now. Um, and what we're showing um, just, you know, uh, initially on the front end of, of this effort is um, that these things can be produced at scale using small footprint um, uh, manufacturing methods um, because of the advantages of continuous flow chemistry and process intensification and automation. Um, we can build in um, automated um, analytical and validation activities um, that report in real time on every step of that manufacturing process. And we are also demonstrating that uh, because of the, the, the cost savings in labor footprint um, and environmental impact, um, we can do this very cost competitively. And, and some of the initial results um, have shown us that, we, that there are groups out there that can manufacture um, you know, off-label drugs and actually um, sell them at about a tenth of what is listed on the uh, VA schedule right now. Um, and still make a profit. So um, that tells us there's plenty of room uh, for um, you know, uh, competition uh, in this space. Um, and you know, it also tells us that it, it has the significant potential to be a uh, resilient uh, method of manufacturing that can withstand those foreign pricing pressures uh, that we worry about. Um, so um, again, uh, we've been afforded about 60 million in the, in the recent bill um, and are looking to expand that um, in order to really build out um, both key starting material and API production capabilities in these very highly distributed uh, manufacturing uh, uh, platforms. Um, 
and, and again, we want to uh, work and we are working hand in glove with the FDA and, and are, um, are launching uh, a new uh, evaluation uh, laboratory um, on the FDA campus in Laurel uh, to take these new technologies and, and get them looked at early in the process to help us figure out um, you know, what is that regulatory environment that needs to surround these, um, both um, from a, from a uh, initial production perspective and initial commissioning perspective, but also longer term, um, you know, uh, because of the quality by design in this process, um, you know, what it affords uh, both, you know, both us, our performers, the FDA, um, the opportunity um, to get out of, you know, um, basically a cycle of reporting and inspection and have, you know, have it just be uh, available um, as these, as these, uh, you know, batches are, are produced using this novel technology. Um, again, uh, playing into bullet three, um, I just mentioned that looking at, you know, continuous improvement, the business continuity plans, um, and, and we are uh, also uh, working to build out, just as Tammy is, um, capabilities that help us um, illuminate supply chain issues um, early so that we can be uh, responsive and reactive uh, in, in as much time ahead of a crisis as possible. Um, some of the other things that, uh, and I, I mentioned this before, but really uh, getting towards um, leveraging um, more data sets to, to build supply chain resilience um, as it relates to pharmaceuticals um, and, and compelling uh, the reporting of volume information, um, you know, complete registration and listing requirements, um, looking at, you know, maybe notification of an increase in demand. And then, as I mentioned before, the, the requirement for the labeling um, of API and finished product to include uh, information on sources and original manufacturers. Um, so uh, I, that is kind of the, the, the abbreviated 101 version. Um, here are all the, uh, the interweb tangles that you can, uh, <laughs> that you can find us at, uh, should you uh, have any additional questions after this. And uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to address the team today and uh, you know, uh, really looking forward to any questions you can have. I may not have good answers, but I'm looking forward to the Thanks, Joe. That was excellent, uh, as was Tammy's presentation. So um, I'm going to be quiet and let Rob ask the first question. Joe, man, oh, man. That's hot stuff that you're doing. Um, I can just see Janet, like, uh, I don't know, the thing that comes to mind I won't say publicly, but I can just see, given the fact that she's, been wanting this to happen for over a decade. Uh, and the idea of using the Laurel, using the campus uh, to do a lot of this is a phenomenal approach. I still remember the pitch battle about, we had to locate it somewhere else because it was too much concentration in Maryland. But I think uh, this is showing the value of having people in the right place. My, my uh, first, I have two questions. One is, yeah, you're right. This is a tangled web of communication, and I'm not sure there's great value in being too public about exactly what you're doing, but I wonder how you are thinking about it, because I can imagine uh, parts of the industry being very anti this for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and the second question is, um, one, I think one of the most difficult things that, that we've been grappling with is where do you draw the line on what's essential? Because the case is made so effectively by people with almost any disease that, and we've seen it that, you know, it can be a, it can be a rare disease or something that doesn't come up that often. But man, if you don't have that drug when you're the person who's sick, it's pretty essential at that point. So, um, yeah, those those I have like twenty other questions, but. Let, let me just say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited on, in what you described. I think it's really important. Yeah, so just to uh, address some of that, um, and, and you're right, we, our, our FDA colleagues are um, very excited about this, uh, both uh, in the commissioner's office and at CEDAR. 
Um, and it's it's a wonderful partnership with them. It, it, it has been just great working with them to build that out and, and to get this online. Um, what I will say is, um, at least from a fill and finish perspective, um, you know, it's it's good news, bad news with this pandemic. Um, you know, the 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 fact that the so um, the majority of fill and finish capacity has been um, devoted to vaccine manufacturing operations has bumped some other folks to the end of the line and the development of novel fill and finish um, capabilities and capacities are being embraced um, by those manufacturers and, and by some folks that probably would be detractors otherwise. Um, I will also say that um, uh, you're absolutely right that you know not everybody's gonna wanna see this successful, especially some of our near peer competitors that have the market cornered um, and some of those folks that are in those lockup contracts that have raised generic drug prices over 15,000% in the last three to five years um, that, you know, will also, um, you know, not be really excited about this. However, um, you know, what it's showing is that there's a new manufacturing model um, outside of traditional methods and there are new uh, players and there's a new market for this um, that's bringing to bear um, you know, folks that you never would have thought that would have gotten involved in this. And I wish I could tell you who, um, but, but it's just outstanding to see um, people now interested in not so much the manufacturing, but what, the dis what this distributed manufacturing can avail um, for healthcare systems, um, for compounders, for, um, for you know, traditional and non-traditional distributors um, as a way to have their own kind of essentials brand, right? Um, that they can that they can then uh, sell. So it's, what it's doing is it's creating its own new market um, instead of trying to square peg and round hole, um, you know, in in the traditional sense uh, with with the traditional batch manufacturers. So, um, and and I could also see some areas where, you know, we have capacities that, you know, the nation is. You know, kind of sold its soul over the last 30 years um, to, you know, offshore interest for a variety of very good reasons to include, you know, um, the, the drive towards the lowest cost of goods and services, the environmental impact, labor costs, the real estate costs. Um, but, you know, um, you know, we are seeing some opportunities that, um, you know, can really reinvigorate certain manufacturing campuses in the United States um, that would have otherwise gone fallow and been lost to, you know, overseas competition. So um, we're seeing some new players and adopters in this market that that is that are very encouraging. Excellent, Craig. Oh, I'm sorry, Rob. Did you want to have a follow up? I, yeah. I what about the essential medicines question? How how are you going to? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, not dodging that on you. So um, so. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're taking a very careful look and we're looking at it through um, a couple lenses. We're looking at it through the current pandemic uh, lens and what is required for critical care patients um, as our kind of starting point um, for what we're deeming. Um, you, got, you have to start somewhere, right? We're never going to be able to uh, we're never going to be able to take that list of 175 and blood products and sterile fluids and come up with something that, you know, um, you know, we, we, we illuminate supply chain issues on and start addressing them through that, through that big lens. So um, we're starting with, you know, critical care application in the current pandemic. And then we're looking at, at it from, you know, beyond this towards, you know, uh, seasonal influenza um, as our starting point. And I, I completely agree with you that, you know, um, if you're that patient with that, with that rare disease or, you know, if you're insulin dependent and, you know, the very limited number of facilities in the United States no longer produce insulin, we have issues, right? So, um, so we are looking at that holistically. Um, but again, the starting point is going in from a, from a critical care lens um, with our providers and partners. Um, and then um, also, you know, we've divided it between clinicians and industry experts um, to help us illuminate this. So that you know, we 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 have a true sense of what is required by the clinical community, and then what is most vulnerable from a production supply chain perspective. Great, 
Okay, thank you. Greg. Gosh, Joe, it's, it's so nice to hear this uh, strategic vision with an operational plan that's focused and has a direction to it. Uh, all that uh, protean kinds of opportunity, uh, you know, starting with rational products, as you just described, I think is really a reasonable thing. And, uh, you know, I'm just really pleased to hear all that you had to say. Um, I'm going to get inside baseball a little bit here, though, and ask the question about how do you work with an entity like BARDA, which has a focused responsibility to develop these medical countermeasures for identified threats? They historically have tried to do some platform investments and so on and so forth. Are you Your $60 million isn't going to go very far with platform development. How much can BARDA... Uh, align their assets and priorities and investment uh, to sort of augment or ap operate synergistically. You mentioned Barda Ventures, but could you explicate that just a little bit more about sure. how that that works? Yeah. So um, with, within the, uh, uh, the the recent allocation of Defense Production Act dollars, uh, we're actually supporting a number of uh, manufacturing expansion initiatives um, with BARDA. Um, we have, I'm not going to say the exact figure, but it is a multi-billion dollar investment that we are, we are providing them funding for in order to expand fill and finish capacities that can be used agnostically for, um, for COVID vaccine or other small molecule drugs in the future. Um, we are also working to, um, uh, with our BARDA colleagues to expand um, supply chains for um, you know those products that are in shortage right now. Um, if you can think about you know everything that goes into the uh, the gene encoded vaccines, uh, for example, or the or the cell based production of um, you know monoclonals or um, or other vaccine products, uh, we are working with them to uh, make those strategic investments in. Um, everything from, you know, bulk cell production um, to ancillary devices and lipids and, and NTP production capacities and fill and finish um, operations that can be used agnostically regardless of what the threat is. Um, so we're working hand in glove with them on all of this. Thanks, Joe. And, and you know, uh I recognize they're a component in a larger industrial-based uh, program, and I'm glad that you're looking at the industrial base. More questions about how you define that, how you engage them, but that's for later. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there's been a, a lot of discussion as of late with the reinvigoration of the FEMC, um, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, build out of the authorities um, of that uh, of that board um, that helped set those requirements, um, especially as the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness and Innovation Act is being reconsidered. Um, so, you know, we're engaged with, um, you know, all of our divisions at ASPR about uh, around this. And, um, you know, I, I, liken, I liken our little group to, you know, kind of the BASF of the response. We're the folks behind the scenes that are building these manufacturing capacities that help them, you know, to get to their goals faster um, and, and build a resilient capability uh, for the United States that we can rely on over the next five or 10 years. So um, that, that's how I see us nesting. So. Okay, well, maybe Craig's uh, point of that's for later is a good segue here because we could go on and on here, Joe and Tammy, you have so many interesting things going on. I'll just say that we're glad you're living the things that we're thinking about. It's, it's encouraging to know that you're out there. But if you will be willing to answer some questions, individual questions from members of the committee uh, as we steam toward the end of our study and, and preparing our report, we'd really appreciate it. Um, this has been really informative, but I'm sure we haven't plumbed everything that we could. So thank you for your time today and, and for your contributions. and. We'll do our best to live up to them. Thank you. Bye. Take care now. Bye.